Recording is on. Ok. The floor is yours. Ok. Well, welcome and bienvenue to another Hack Night Neurotech X Paris. Uh, I would like to introduce today uh, Dabishish Das Chakladar, who is coming to us from uh, IIT Rorky and will be presenting his work on cognitive workload estimation using EEG signals. Dabishish. Yes, thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. So, uh, the topic is that already Morgan says that it's a cognitive workload estimation using EEG signals. Uh, this is the outline of the today's presentation. Uh, so, I actually briefing the three main applications what I have done in my PhD work and some literature survey. So, the first, uh, I have to highlight some introductory part that what is called a workload. Actually, it's a physical or mental requirements associated with your task or combination of tasks while the subject is working and how much pressure he has, uh, has to uh, take during com accomplishing the task. And uh, it is divided into two parts, physical and cognitive task uh, type of workload. And the physical workload is mainly basically the physical resources uh, for used during, the, during accomplishing the task. And the mental workload uh, or the cognitive workload is the mental stress uh, associated with the uh, during the task and um, so the topic is related to the mental workload or cognitive workload so i actually highlight this topic is more emphasizedly so this this can be measured the workload level that is the low medium hard and different types of workload level can be measured using three types uh, one is subjective measure that is the rating based measure uh, it is actually it's actually done by the uh, the participant the uh, so he or she can rate the how the task is how what is the feelings of uh fees or heart there during the task and then so based on this rating the workload can be measured and based uh, after that some suggest uh, statistical test can be performed uh, for the classification task and uh, second one is performance based measure based on the behavior of, of operator operator during the task and the, the last and final one is physiological uh, measure. Uh, so based on some physiological measure like cardiovascular measure, respiratory measure, nervous system measure, we actually measure, uh, evaluate the mental workload of a participant. So there are different types of EEG based application in like air traffic controllers, driving tasks, situation awareness, uh, in back tasks, mental arithmetic tasks. Uh, so, uh, DG span task. So, multiple tasks are there in in recent uh, research area. So, workload estimation is a very good topic in the EEG application right now. So, uh, this is and uh, this is the one very common uh, NASA TLS workload uh, subjective measures scale. Uh, so, you can see that the uh, the scale is divided into uh, mental demand, physical demand, temporal demand, performance, effort, and frustration. So, this is the this is the, I think it's seven, uh, three, four, five, six. Okay, this is six. So six matrix are there and each matrix actually divided into different parts. So very low to very high. So this is the ratings. So based on the subjects actually put some mark on this every matrix based on their, their scale and the average scale uh, has been evaluated as for the overall performance of the participant for the task. The second and uh, and um, now the, the, the physiological measures, I already said that the cardiovascular measures, respiratory system and nervous system, different types of measures are there and it is more widely used to evaluate the uh, participant workload. Uh, so in the, in the nervous system, is a, in the, all of the physiological measures, the nervous system measure uh, is a mostly used and, and uh, apart from this, uh, the brain activity is the main important <laughs> measure within the uh, entire physiological measures so in brain activity you can you can find that uh, there are different types of brain activity measures like eeg fmri nirs fnrs everything but uh, as the brain signal the brain signal is very high temporal resolution so uh, so every millisecond or every microsecond you can you can identify the the, uh, the non-linearity of the human brain, the collection of neural sparks, uh, which is uh, which which is generated in the scalp level. So we can identify from the scalp level's potential that how we can uh, how one subject actually behave during their task. 
So for this high temporal resolution, EEG is mostly used for the workload estimation. So uh, this is the basics of EEG. Uh, so EEG signals at uh, the brain rhythm can be divided into defined frequency band. And based on the defined frequency band, we can divide the EEG into five bands, as we delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma. Okay. <laughs> and now coming to the main cognitive load. So what is cognitive load? Right now we can we actually define the basic definition of, of, of workload. Now I can go to the deep that what is the cognitive load and the, actually it is the three types of cognitive load is there. One is intrinsic cognitive load that is based on the uh, the inherent nature of the task that how your task is you organized your task. Like in n by task, you, if you increase the value of n like 1 and 2 and 3 then the hum the participant has to remember the if in a in a one back task the participant has to remember the one letter one letter prior to the current letter so if for an example if it is a b and a then the a is coming after b so there is one gap between two a so that is a one back and it is two back that is two gap so if you increase the value of n, that means the, the participant has to remember more number of num uh, letters or digits in, in his or her working memory. So that means the working memory capacity has been increased and the workload also be increased. Now, in, it is based on the experimental design. And the second one is extraneous or cognitive load. In that case, uh, it is def defined, defined by the external pressure or external noise in the, in the situation uh, situation uh, like that uh, in the experimental task you you define the uh, the time period for every task is very small so but your your experiment uh, or your like your uh, your in that task the number of stimuli or number of digit is very fast but the time is very slow so that means the temporal demand is very slow, very less compared to the stimuli number of stimuli so that time the extraneous cognitive load will be increased. So there should be some balance. Okay. So and this is the second type of uh, cognitive load. And the third type of cognitive load is rarely used. Actually, it is mainly defined with the cognitive model uh, because it is mainly related to the working memory capacity. The how many stimuli you can uh, store in a in a one trial, or how or what is your response accuracy? Okay. So it actually directly related to the working memory capacity of human. Based on these three, uh, three types of cognitive load, mental efficiency can also be defined based on the uh, performance measure and the mental effort. Okay, equal to uh, the efficiency is because uh, from the performance measure of your uh, response accuracy or response time and the mental effort means that you can, how you can, uh, how, how much efficiently you can uh, correctly answer your uh, result in in back, in, in back case uh, you can uh, how you can uh, praise the target or non target and, and how much it is correct okay so based on this parameter efficiency can be measured so this is the one uh, whatever i have i have told that is the, it is the pictorial diagram that of the workload estimation that some tasks demands man that means that some tasks uh, the inputs of the task is uh, and the working environment, both are the input, and based on the individual perception, he can behave based on these two inputs, and uh, uh, and his or her workload can be defined, and uh, and last the performance of the in uh, of the task has been evaluated based on some performance metrics. Like in machine learning, we can use uh, some AUC ROC score, and in uh, statistical test, we can use ANOVA. Or Wilkinson ran some test, different types of tests are there. So it actually says that how the response time is in response accuracy yeah, is increased or decreased based on some trials and number of stimuli, etc. And this is some uh, these are some uh, studies uh, based on some workload estimation. Uh, they how they used the different type of task, the mental arithmetic that is MA. Uh, 3D object revolving on axis, uh, some, uh, it is a complex task and uh, what is, uh, they have used the PSD power spectrum density, atmosphere entropy and ANN, the classifier, they have used ANN, artificial neural network, 
and what the accuracy they have achieved is 79.5 percent. The second one is air traffic management task, and they have used the same the PSD uh, and the KNN classifier, and they have achieved 84 percent accuracy. Third one is working memory task, and uh, they have used the deep learning uh, classifiers, and they got 92.5 percent of accuracy. And the last one is it's a cross task. They have used the uh, NVAC as well as main arithmetic. And they use the brain activity, cortical brain level brain activity, and they achieve the 87 percent for the cross tasks. And in, for individual tasks, they have achieved the 88 percent, the maximum for the invert task. And along with the Walker simulation, I also discussed uh, the brain connectivity studies because one of my paper uh, is related to the brain connectivity. So uh, it's actually uh, during the uh, after the classification of the workload level uh, so uh, how how the uh, the brain dynamics that means that uh, as i told that the eeg signal is very good in temporal resolution so it must happen that uh, in very uh, fraction of second the brain uh, dynamics or brain uh, uh, the i mean to say that um, and the the excitation of brain regions has been changed so how this information flow and how this connectivity within the scalp level, how it can be arranged? Because is it based on, based on the, some functional connectivity or, or effective connectivity like that? So, uh, so this is covered up using the brain connectivity studies. So in the first case, you can see that the personal activation task, uh, the one tunnel has been used the correlation that is the power power based connectivity and the phase phase log value the PLV. Is both of the power based connectivity that is belongs to the functional connectivity <coughs> and the graph uh, graph CNN and they got 98.79% of accuracy. The second one is true color test and it is based on some PDC and graph measure and 89% accuracy they got. The third one is driving simulation, it is the effective connectivity and uh, the, uh, the fourth one is drowsiness of driving simulation and this is based on the transfer entropy, it is also of, of the effective connectivity and the last one is schizophrenia and it is uh, for the uh, CN and PDC. So uh, coming to the application one, uh, the, in the first application I use the uh, two deep, uh, it actually uh, the framework is defined here, in the figure you can see uh, the first the topographical videos have been captured for the different workload levels. And then, after preparing of EEG, EEG, the more de main disadvantage of EEG is that it is a very noise prone signal. So, we actually perform the preprocessing of signals using ICAs and bandpass filter. And then, we use the uh, topographical videos for every workload level. And then, from workload, the videos, we extract the frames and then we pass the frame to the feature extraction block. In the feature extraction block, we use two, uh, uh, two deep models framework. One is variational auto encoder, which extracts the localized latent features, uh, and then we use the attention based feature over that uh, latent feature. So, uh, to identify the actual excited region in the scalp, so so that we can, we can, we can identify that the, the deep model, the 2 d cn based team can identify the, uh, the level more efficiently that which, uh, which region of the brain is more affected during the which workload level. So there, there should be one connectivity. Uh, so this is the experimental analysis. We used uh, the four uh, workload level. <coughs> one is uh, baseline and and three one is and another is low workload level, another is medium workload level and the last one is hard workload level. So the workload state is the, the, the middle one that is the orange color box and the baseline state after that workload state and there is an entire trial state and it is repeated for three trials. So and this is the framework of the uh, more first model that is the VAE model. We, we, can, we first chase, we give the input and then uh, it has very big inputs to uh, and we have no we have no such <laughs> uh, higher end machines to uh, training this you know, big uh, image lots of image so we resize the image in a smaller end and then we pass to the VE model the VE model actually uh, used uh, based on the CNN model 
in the three level cn model you see in the, in the bottom section of the cn con 1 con 2 and con con 3 and then the noise free localized feature in the out in the in the output box you can see that the blue regions in the green topographical map in a green topographical map you can see that the, the blue color some blue colored boxes is blue color shades are there that is the remote lo localized features so that features will actually pass to the second level of CBAM, second level of attention model. We can find the attention. So we, uh, because in this case, we don't understand the which level of attention we have to give to the deep model. Because deep model actually work based on the attention of spatial level or channel level. So we, we uh, extract the uh, re redefined feature for using the CBAM. Uh, it consists of two models. One is channel attention model, it's actually 1D attention model, and it is consists of a max pool and then some MLP, common MLP, multi layer perceptron, and then both the output feature of is uh, extracted from both uh, common MLP has been merged to make the channel attention in the top, in the top box. You can see the top box. This is the MC, the channel attention. And this channel attention actually multiplied with the spatial attention that is the 2D model. And this 2D model both actually multiplied with the original feature and then the redefined feature actually passed to the our deep model for the classification. And this is the classification model. Uh, the that you can see the attention based features, I think, uh, the yeah, yellow one in the left hand side is passed to the deep model. The 2D CN BLST model, and then the classification of the cognitive set have been performed. So, and this is the results and the results analysis case that we can. And the first one is that in the CBAM, we actually, uh, as we can see in this slide, there is channel attention and period attention. There is two attention model in CBAM. So, <coughs> we actually uh, change the configuration of both attention in sequential as well as parallel model and check whether the accuracy has been increased or decreased and and we also change some hyperparameters of both the module means channel and as well as special and uh, special module and check how many accuracy has been drifted for changing this configuration we get the 83.13 percent of accuracy maximum for the four work four class workload levels <laughs> And this is the two class and three class work workload levels. Uh, the I, I think the two class we got the binary classifier it, it achieves the highest accuracy 92 percent, 0.09 percent, and uh, for three class we get 86.36 percent. And uh, the table three shows the ablation study as we use the three models. That means the deep model uh, and VA and CBAM. So it is very much necessary that uh, which model is more important in that case so we actually separate each and every model and then check how much performance has been changed so in the bottom table you have in the right hand side you can check that, that if we use only deep model then how much accuracy has been achieved if we use ae plus deep model then what is the accuracy and if we use all the three then what is the accuracy so and you can check that and it also check for different types of deep models so this table com this table actually combines two experimental uh, analysis one is ablation study and one is in the different types of deep model for uh, this uh, deep uh, deep model structure actually different deep model structure configurations uh, to be seen in gru to be seen in bstm to be seen in bgru like that and the second application actually uh, it is it is for the end back task the first one is the last one is the, your uh, mental arithmetic and this is the end back task different uh, experiment and this in this case we actually fuse the multi ma, the, ma, the two different types of features of eeg signals and and the combined multimodal feature, fusion features in pass to the clusters for <coughs> for highlighting the workload levels this paper has been accepted in ICBR this year. And the last paper, the last uh, application has been uh, accepted 
and uh, in the PCDS and IDB transition of cognitive and uh, cognitive and development system. And so in this case, and the uh, stimuli interval is three seconds. So we divide this uh, each signals into three second interval, and the, the same time we actually find the spectral power of each E bands, and it is and this the top one. With the top one signals uh, specific time wise uh, signals we pass to the temporal VA and the latent features extracted from the temporal VA. <coughs> Whereas in the bottom one, we actually pass to the spectral feature and spectral image to the CN model, and that is the spectral is the spectral VA, and the latent feature is also extracted from the spectral VA. And the both the latent features is very much useful for the representation learning in the recent world so in the recent research in the clustering based model the deep representation model is fastly used so we we also implement that model with the multimodal features of eeg so these two features have been combined uh, in the combined latent has been passed to the subspace clustering so now why we use the subspace clustering because the subspace clustering, the brain signal actually it is a combined of many signals. So as we know that EEG is a very much suffer from the uh, volume conduction effects. It's a very well known problem of EEG signal. So uh, it may happen that the uh, one back uh, one back signal has been mixed with some two back signals, and two back signals is mixed with some idle or zero back signal. So <laughs> the sparse subspace clustering. What it has done, uh, it has done actually, it actually uh, separate the most common features in a different dimensions, in a different subspace. Okay, and from their subspace, the very unique representation of every data point has been selected for as a as a representative. Okay, so uh, so in that case, uh, from every subspace, we actually collect the more efficient. Uh, a sample point that is that that can express the self expressiveness property of the subspace clustering so that that uh, that cluster can separate from each other so the cluster separability has been increased uh, this is the uh, general image of, of in back tasks that the uh, you can see uh, the uh, the video i don't know the body the video is Can you hear the sound? No. I think it's the same problem. Uh, it, it's okay though. It, it gets across the idea, or you know, certainly. Of okay. What so okay. So I, I I just uh, I just adjusted the right hand side the image. So you can see that there is a uh, the first uh, first letter is Q, and uh, after third in the uh, fourth one it is it is also Q. So there is two gaps, right? So this is the three vectors. So because after three consecutive data, the Q is coming. So this is a match. Q and Q is match. So the participants have to remember the earlier three characters. When the fourth one is coming, Q, he or she have to press the button for the matching character. Similarly, if it is not matched, like that K, K is not matched with the T, so he or she have to press the non-match button. So, like this way, he or she have to press the match and non-match button, and within the time stimulated time period, uh, the response accuracy has been achieved. So, this is a simple n back task. You can change uh, n equal to one, two, three, anyone, four, five based on your experiment, and you can check the how the response time, response accuracy has been changed or the uh, classification results also can also change. <coughs> I think this is good uh, after that. So, uh, this is a very <laughs> big slide, so I, I try to complete it very quickly. So, uh, this is the deep representation learning, as I already told, that it actually uh, transforms the high dimensional EG features into low dimensional feature space. And for that, we use the latent, latent space, and this is the for mathematical definition of latent space. And uh, this uh, we use the latent space, uh, latent field using the VA. 
okay <laughs> because the va can uh, va can uh, actually overcome the overfitting issue of uh, auto encoder okay because the latent space representation is very good for the va compared to other auto encoder model so in the a temporal v and spectral v i already told that it is a three second interval of similar representation and for each stimulus representation we capture the spectral images and there's a LSTM model and the units uh, from the 6, 12, and 18 of units, there are three layers of LSTM, LSTM and the second one is spectral V and there's uh, two layers of convolution layer, 16 or 24 filters are there for consecutively and there is uh, there is some max putting layer in between two convolutional layers. And uh, they followed the last layer is for, uh, actually consists of 10 units of dense layer because the last layer should be combined so the number of neurons should be same for both VAs and this is the SSC and I already told that why we, we uh, I use the SSC model because uh, it is a very much important for to select some point that represents the the entire workload class for segregation and separations uh, between the different clusters so uh, this is the important thing for, we use the, for the sparse subset clustering, and uh, this is the results. Uh, we actually we actually use that uh, M uh, mean clustering accuracy and mean rand index for the um, uh, performance of the clustering. And this is the cluster representation of defined workload class. So uh, as it's the Actually, uh, it's a five level of workload. Uh, one is one back, one is two back, uh, and one is idle. This is a visual stimuli, and other two stimuli are in the visual as well as audio. That is dual one back, dual two back. So that is more complex. So this is a five level of workload uh, levels are there, and the uh, experimental task and uh, based on that, it is the first is uh, idle versus one back, and then it is the one back versus two back. You can see that uh, for the higher level of workload, the data samples are mixed mixed together because the at the brain signals are mis may some misses and uh, there is some uh, miss the humans can you cannot understand that what is the one back or two back because the uh, because when you press the button you can you cannot understand, identify the it is it is very much common one back or two back it is very much common because the one character is between them. So there is some mismatch, some prediction error is there. So some uh, clusters are overlaps. But for the lower level, I did one back. It is very much good that participant can, uh, can identify it very, very easily. <coughs> and this is the uh, some uh, the results. Based on that, the clustering actually measures some uh, clustering accuracy and hand index for all the subject wise results for all the conditions and you can see that uh, highest i think highest is uh, mean results is 95.2 for condition 4 and uh, that means condition 4 is uh, d two back versus dual two back this is a comparison analysis uh, uh, with different traditional uh, clustering methods k means hierarchical db scan for all the conditions and uh, this is the application 3 uh, it is actually based on some large volume of data we use the large volume of data and we uh, classify the workload levels and then we uh, identify the which how the brain connectivity actually used between the defined cognitive states and this paper is also accepted in the TCGS so uh, first one is this paper is divided into two parts. Uh, the first one is a deep ensemble model. The ensemble method is first introduced in this paper because uh, the data data set is too too high. So uh, first we use the ABCSP method, filter bank common spatial pattern, based deep ensemble model. So as per the ABCSP concept, the far subject data actually divided into four filter bands: delta, theta, alpha, beta, and then uh, for each filter bank features, uh, CSC features, we pass to the uh, mutual information based in, in uh, important features, and then the most important features have been passed to the deep model. 
and these procedures are actually repeated for all the subjects. So you can see from the figure that all the subjects, uh, important features of all the subjects from the MIBIF actually pass to the deep models. And then the deep model, all the deep models, uh, deep models are trained based on the important features and the weighted average of individual models data actually predict the, uh, actually result the uh, output of the entire model. Sorry, sorry, can I ask a question? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sorry, I, I, I got called to the door. <laughs> so, um, uh, is this still the MBAC data that you're modeling? And uh, this, this experiment? Yeah, this is still the MBAC task? No, 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 it is, uh, it is, it is the main arithmetic task. Ah, uh, okay, okay, sorry, thank you, thank you, sorry, I had to, uh, somebody came to the door, so I just wanted to see, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, uh, so, uh, so, uh, this, uh, after classification of the, uh, deep, deep ensemble model, that's this, the, 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 each and every, uh, for each and every cognitive state, we have to perform the brain connectivity network, okay, so, uh, this is the uh, illustrative model of the ensemble model. Uh, so the features of MIBF, BIF actually pass to the L1, L2, uh, up to LN. This is the stack uh, LSTMs. And then the performance matrix of each LSTM, the AUC score, this is a performance measure of all um, machine learning classifiers, has been evaluated. And then the weight, weight is based upon the, uh, this average, based on the average of AUC's model. You can see the equation number one. This is the weight, average weight. <coughs> and so from the average weight, we actually identify the uh, Y ensemble. That is the prediction of ensemble for the T plus one state. So that is the summation of Yn of T into Wn of T. Okay. So this, then right, like this, uh, you can identify the out, uh, prediction of the uh, deep models. And this is the one, uh, ABCSP, uh, these results and uh, how the each and every bands uh, results will come. You can, I think you can see that the alpha bands, uh, some alpha bands results is good compared to other bands. The second one. <laughs> so the task and resting state. In the meter resting there is two class in task and resting state. And this is the output of uh, the B model. Uh, the age score is 9, 0 0.91. And this is the scalability test that how, uh, how much our model has been performed good for the if the if the number of subjects has been increased. So you can see in that up to number of if the number of subjects is 10, after that the model has, model performance has been uh, in a straight line. So it is not increased or decreased anymore. So it is stable. Second part is that after after the deep ensemble model classification we actually perform the brain network analysis. So how the, uh, the for every cognitive state, how the, um, how the brain, uh, how the each and every channel or every segment of brain is connected or the, how the brain dynamics has been performed. So it is the uh, first one is the star state in the A and cell. B is the resting state of uh, brain network. In, you can see that the top number, the top is number is ERP peak and uh, each of every more nodes are the uh, EEG channels. So each and every channels actually uh, actually uh, from the source channel based on the brand power of the every channel and uh, we find out the I think it should be good. Yeah. So uh, it actually based on three connectivity matrix. One is threshold matrix, second one is function and the third one is every connectivity matrix. So uh, in the first end, a, a threshold based connectivity actually uh, defined based on some connectivity matrix uh, ranging from 0 to 1. And uh, uh, and uh, and then we identify for the each ERP peak and the, what is the maximum, uh, what is the source channel. So, because based on some uh, its band power of the easy band for the best band, the best band means uh, what we get the best band in the APCSP model. In the earlier part, it's the alpha band. So when that uh, alpha band, which is the band maximum band power for the, uh, which channel is the maximum band power for the ERP peak, and that 
is marked as a source channel and then we find out that the gc means that ganger causality of that channel to the other channel for the next grpp and then like that way we identify that uh, uh, which is the maximum gc from the other channels okay and based on some threshold value we actually uh, if, the th if the gc value is greater than the, than the threshold value then we mark that it, okay this there is some information passed from this channel to that uh, in the next channel source to target channel for who, why, while the erp peak has been erp transition has been uh, performed that means the brain uh, that some temporal some temporal demand temporal change has been performed so there is some changes the information changes between the two uh, scalp level electrodes so this is the main motto of the connectivity network and like that way we identify the each and every source to target source to target now after that we actually merge all the source source electrodes and then uh, after marching the source network, we uh, we march the ERP wise ERP peak wise source network. And after combining the ERP peak wise source network, we combine all the ERP peaks and we get the final we get the final model like this one. First, we find out to F3 to F8, F4, F AFP2 like that all the source target. So and this is done for the ERP peak one. That means 0 0.215 to 0, uh, 2.689. This is the one part has been performed first. Then for first of the second ERPP channel, that, is, that means F8 to other channels, that means the next ERPP, we found all the connectivity matrices. And if the this GC value is greater than the threshold value, then we pick this, that edge. So like that way, that they, then the second to third transition, we get another small sub network and like that way there is a third to fourth there is another sub network and like that way third fourth fifth and up to up to any number of times we can uh, identify the network and then we combine all the sub network to build a final network so this is the erp peak uh, erp uh, peak wise connectivity network for the two states and this is the subject choice results <coughs> based on uh, clustering uh, coefficient, transitivity, and global efficiency. Global efficiency is used for the uh, for the external communication. That means the your your brain region and uh, the brain region one and brain region two there is not um, uh, connected and uh, uh, connected anatomically. But structurally they are not connected but you can see that there is some uh, information change uh, uh, through another through a common node or common t channel so the information has been passed so there is uh, dependent based on the global efficiency and the local for the local efficiency for the same net the structural no, uh, area uh, while, while the information has been changed this is measured by the clustering coefficient and transitivity so these three matrices have been used to identify the information processing between the brain regions for different cognitive state through this brain network. So this is for the, all the subject wise results is there. So it is all about from my end and this is the other conclusion. Uh, the in application one, we use the VA and CPFMS model to estimate the AMA task, military arithmetic task. And in, in application two, we used a deep clustering model for multiple stimuli based in web task. And in application three, we used the ensemble, deep ensemble model uh, for estimating workload. And we also identify the brain connectivity network to identify the information processing between the EG channels to capture the uh, capture for how the brain dynamics or the underlying brain networks will process for each of these states. That is the reference of this presentation. Thank you. Questions? Thank you so much, Kenny. Uh, could you, could you uh, go back, though, uh, to your uh, uh, conclusions? Uh, yeah, one more. Uh, um, to the, the three applications that uh, uh, right at the end. Three applications, okay. Yeah, yeah, the, the... 
Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, because you, I, I, I don't think you said enough about application three, or maybe, uh, um, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, that you just presented application three, but, um, uh, but that, uh, that was definitely an important one too. Uh, um, so a application three, like application one, is still the it's the mental arithmetic, arith mental arithmetic task, yeah. Yes, yes. Right, right, right. Okay, okay. And uh, the only way to do the test is. But they are different. The cognitive states are different. In the application one, in the application uh, one, the cognitive states there are four cognitive states. One is baseline. That means and the, the participant uh, has been no, no task only uh, uh, close their eyes and uh, taking taking rest and low workload. There is some uh, some mind, uh, very simple arithmetic tasks was there there and uh, in a me medium workload there is some complex tasks is there and the high workload level there is some very complex tasks and the time duration is same. The temporal demand is more as per the workload level is. Uh, increased that in the first uh, the, that is the first minute arithmetic test and in the second arithmetic test that is a different that is the one is baseline task then that means the resting state the same as the first one but in the second state <coughs> the arithmetic task the participant has to uh, there there is one uh, subtraction that means uh, maybe uh, 387 minus 9 maybe the what are the results the result uh, he can uh, he can um, uh, imagine in your mind and after that whatever the result that means it, it may be the 350 or something like that so then the participant have asked that you can you can subtract one digit from this every time within two seconds so 350 minus one 350 minus two 350 minus three like that he had to remember this thing so this is a task state so uh, irrespective of the uh, uh, your uh, arithmetic task, this entire experiment is defined. I see. I see. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. I, I appreciate that. I, I mean, it, it's it's super important. I think. Uh, um, I mean, that gets to my first. Uh, you know, my first comments on this, which is that the tasks are so important for this, right? Yes. Yes. Like, right. It, it is is you know it's like why why is EEG classification hard? <laughs> Is because you know it, because we don't uh, you know I images that have labels are so much easier to work with than than what we have with with uh, uh, EEG and you know mm. being able to control mental states right yes 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 right you know and so it, it, part of that I mean as I'm sure you know you know there's big difference you know that the kind of the the windowing choice that you made. Uh, um, you know, I, I forget. I, I forget how long it was for the the mental arithmetic, but you know, you have to choose. You know, you have to choose this window, and over that window, it, it's it's not always mental arithmetic, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> you know, yes, yes, yes. It, it's it, we just we just know that it's in there somewhere, right? Um, and uh, and like the, the same thing with the with the end back task. Uh, um, you know, I think you had like three seconds there. Um, yes, yes. And um, you know that makes it. Uh, um, you know, this is this is work that is very dependent on our on our task and and the task's ability to you know keep a person doing something uh, um, during that period of time. Um, so it, it, it's definitely it's definitely rough, um, uh, but I wanted to see. So um, in, in terms of the performance measures, so I mean, you, you talked about the um, uh, um, you're you're analyzing the uh, the physiological measures. How, how yes. did did you try to bring in the performance measures? I mean, I'm sure you. You excluded you excluded trials where they got the, the arithmetic wrong, or what did you do with that? Uh, in that case, uh, in the some there are some trial uh, actually 
in the erp case i actually have what is the trial wise data trial wise data in the time lock event yeah okay, for so so the, the, in that case the uh, your trial wise noise whatever you told the trial wise noise has been eliminated and in other sense it can be also defined that the, based on that uh, some uh, trial with the very much noise or the or there is some uh, the response accuracy is not so much good so we can exclude that trial also sure sure i i, I just i noticed that like with when when you discuss when you 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 terms um, multimodal variational autoencoder that uh, it seemed like you still you still meant uh, something from the EEG you know as opposed to uh, um, uh, bringing in you know like reaction times or you know some uh, some other some other measure you know. Um, that uh, um, would would perhaps get at you know how the person was doing with the task. You know what I mean? Okay. So you uh, you mentioned that uh, the uh, the subjective measures that means uh, the response. I, I, I want to say I want to say performance measures, right? So so when you when you started, you talked about the you know the, the three you know subjective. Subjective performance and physiological. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and and well, so so you know, and um, you know, performance measures can can be uh, uh, can can track the EEG, right? I mean, to some degree. Uh, uh, yeah. Actually, I don't uh, use so much in performance measure. Actually, it is a physiological measure. Is uh, I think it's not uh, mapped with these performance measures. Uh, I think so because it's a it's a it's a, uh, it's a behavioral task. So uh, uh, it's a more more dependent on the subjective ratings or something like that. So means that means that uh, if you if you take the ratings from the subjective measures, the NASA TLS or something like that, and then you use apart from the classification. And the deep model and machine learning classifier. If you you use the uh, statistical test, like if you for the two uh, for the two class classification, you can use the Wilkerson rank uh, sign and uh, rank some test, rank test. You can you can some rank test. So you can think that wow, whatever it is the more significant or not like that. So uh, or uh, some metric some parameters parameters for that for whatever uh, means uh, suppose. Some in some experiment people do some post experimental task. That means uh, for uh, for the game back task and mental arithmetic in which task they have feel bored or which task they have more attentive. For these are the parameters and these parameters have been uh, parametric test has been done by the statistical task based on the performance the performance of the subject during the test during the task. This can be measured with the subjective rating subjective ratings. So both both subjective and performance are aligned, but the physiological is different. It actually based on some uh, some e signals data and how the model actually capture and what is the means what is the prediction and the actual model data more uh, collaborate with, with each other like that. So, but uh, uh, you know, you, you could you could bring in a performance, say a performance measure. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, in in my paper, I write it, but actually, it is the it is the uh, it is a snippet, just brief of discussion. So, in sure. paper, I have write I have written the behavioral behavioral uh, results because uh, it is a statistical uh, result. So, it is a uh, thumb rule. Means apart from the class uh, deep models, you have to you need the performance measures. That means the uh, the behavior the behavioral task behavioral uh, analysis right so that need to do yeah yes yeah, so yeah. I have to do I have also do done the same thing because because we we talked a little bit uh, um, you know uh, yesterday about uh, you know using cognitive models uh, yes, yes. To, to model model the task and that that's something that you could do um, that uh, uh, kind of captures what you think is happening say in that three seconds during the end back right and 
and uh, and you know the the, uh, the the reaction time can be this this online measure that's coming along with the EEG that's that's saying something about the the single trial performance, but. Uh, um, yeah. Well, it, it, so that gets me into another question, is which is, um, uh, what are future directions for you? And um, you know, do you do you have any any ideas on what you'd like to do if you could continue this work? Uh, uh, first of all, I have to do. I have uh, actually two objectives are there. The future direction one is that um, in the brain connectivity perspective. Mm -hmm. Actually, I have done the functional and effective connectivity. That is more basically based on the scalp level electrode uh, level connectivity. But uh, in cortex level connectivity, the most of the uh, person use the fMRI or the voxel based connectivity. That is more important. I think so because in some uh, disease or some application, E is not suitable. So that is the one drawback of E. So I think uh, it can be good if I uh, if I understand and if I work on the structural connectivity using fMRI. There is some uh, good uh, results and good resolution as well because it's a very good spatial resolution in E is very poor spatial resolution. That is one drawback. So uh, apart from this, one one is that uh, the structural connectivity, and second one is that uh, how to. Uh, uh, combine the cognitive modeling with the EEG because uh, whatever I have read, uh, although I don't read too much, and uh, there is uh, millions of cognitive models, otherwise, I have read it so far. Uh, but uh, the basics of cognitive model, the actor, and the things I have, I check some papers, they actually find out the EEG and cognitive models, they actually find out the dipoles. And uh, from the ICA component, and they find out the uh, important IC component. That means the independent component. And from there, there they find the dipoles. And from that dipoles, they they try to identify the actor, mod, the different modules of actor. Actually, there is a different module, different point. You doing the cognitive task. There is a different underlying module, the motor module, the perception module, and the working memory module, the goal module. So there are different type of models are there in the actor. So sure. they actually try to connect those modules with the dipoles. So they, that they, I found that they have tried it. But uh, I think uh, uh, this is very old type of concept uh, because there is different type of uh, cognitive models are there. So like sore, uh, least, uh, so in that case, these are. So in that case, they have done some uh, reinforcement learning uh, over there. So uh, so that is then then that, that maybe one direction to work in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, so I mean, I had this as as uh, my comment on the the, uh, um, the kind of network connectivity was definitely you know have you tried dynamic causal modeling? And um, as as you know, steps to build uh, to build a connectivity network and 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 test a couple models as opposed to uh, uh, as opposed to yeah. If you want to, um, you can uh, stop sharing your screen, and we'll we'll be able to see you better. Uh, okay, okay, no, I I I'm sharing, sharing, sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the um, uh, you know dynamic. Yeah, Yes, yeah, my charge, my actually my charge is <laughs> going over. Let me charge. Yes, sir. Oh, sure, sure, yeah, yeah, please. Plug yeah. yeah. well, in your laptop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you already got the, the video in the camera? Yes, I just uh, yeah. uh, pick it on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, so, um, 
Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, you know, that, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the network discovery that you're doing is, is, is very interesting, but is, uh, you know, as, as I'm sure you know, that is, is very difficult and, and, you know, because of the, um, you know, the, the, the heterogeneity of both subject response and, and, and uh, you know, spatial, spatial distribution uh, uh, and subject timing makes the, the, you know, that kind of network discovery very, very difficult to, to generalize, you know? Yes, yes, yes. And, and one of the, one of the, like, I think, you know, this is, this is my favorite, uh, uh, and so I'm perhaps biased, but, you know, the, the, the dynamic causal models for ERPs is a, a terrific way to test a number of networks with the data that you have, as opposed to, you know, trying to find the networks in what is very noisy data, you know? Um, uh, and uh, the uh, Pyrimol uh, lab is uh, working. So how many channels was that data? Uh, is it a fast one, right? Yeah, the, the mental arithmetic, I think. Uh, it's a, it's a 32 channels. It's like a 32 channel system. So, so you, you know, yeah, keep that up uh, for a second there. And, um, sorry, if you, if you go back, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, these are 10 sec, uh, oh, 60 seconds workload state. Okay, okay. So I mean, it's definitely going for something like a like a continuous performance task in the sense of like just keeping keeping arithmetic going, yeah. Yes. Right, right, and and um, uh, uh, yeah, with and with thirty two channels data, you know that that's going to be um, it's going to be alias, right? That um, you know it, it's it's. Certainly, like you said, like, uh, um, you know, I think Scott McCaig's uh, results where, you know, like finding single dipole generators with ICA came from maybe like, maybe 64 channel data, but maybe, maybe 32. <clears throat> uh, um, but you have this problem when, when without uh, dense sampling, you can get spatial aliasing. Because you just don't have the, the coverage, you know, the, the, the density and the, the whole coverage to, to uh, capture the spatial dynamics and across subjects that's just not, um, that's just not very reliable, you know. But um, uh, so D DCM uh, only allows you to test a few models, but it, it allows you to, to use that data to say uh, what's the, you know, which, which model has more evidence. You know, uh, uh, but I, I think that maybe would be perhaps better for the um, the end back task because the end back task was more like a, a three second trial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, I, I think that would be really interesting to see. You know, and um, uh, how how many do you know how many how many subjects did you have for this? Uh, I think like twenty four or. Uh, for the for this application one, yeah. No, uh, I, I I it's a uh, nine subject. Oh, just just nine. It, was it was it uh, application three that had more? Uh, application three has more. Oh, okay, okay. I I, I yeah. You know, I was connecting those two. Gotcha. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, and then. I'm curious. Are, are you familiar? Yeah, this is what I, that's why I was thinking you had more. Okay, so this is this is a, a second mental arithmetic task. Yeah. Yes. I see. I see. Um, uh, and are you familiar with uh, Irina Hagen's work? Um, so she's at DeepMind and is on the paper that they had looking at um, EEG. Uh, so they had a, a EEG depression uh, paper, and uh, 
they were, it's, it's called something like disentangling, um, you know, disentangling EEG with beta variational autoencoders. Um, and I thought it might be, might be of, of some interest uh, um, because of the, the kind of, um, the, your use of, of autoencoders. Um, definitely, definitely recommend that one uh, uh, for sure. Um, deep, uh, uh, deep brain, right? Deep mind? Yeah, let me, I'll, I'll find the, um, it's like, um, and like Higgins, Higgins I think is like the second to last author. Um, yeah, here, I got it, I got it. You send me the uh, link uh, or the message. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's it's called uh, representational learning for improved interpretability, interpretability, uh, interpretability and classification accuracy. Um, yeah, one sec. But. Uh, Yeah, I'll, I'll um, okay, I can send it to you your, your, um, directly, but uh, it's, uh, it's definitely good on uh, Yeah, and um, yeah. Because again, it's it's something where they're also trying to um, again, like like you know, because of the EEGs, you know, yeah. I mean, it, it's really an issue of of whether the autoencoder gets a good latent representation, right? And. And you know, there's this. This uh, I think is one of the reasons that. Um, well, she's she's been working on these beta variational encoders for a while, but but it's definitely trying to allow more flexibility in the, uh, um, in terms of uh, allowing the, the representation to, um, uh, yeah, be be. Uh, uh, relearned together with the classification, and yes, you know, yes, so yes. It, it, even though she's got this depression example, uh, um, I think it'll still map well to your, you know, um, multi-class uh, uh, classification. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Actually, but, in the in the in the VAE, in the variation autoencoder. Uh, as as the latent features uh, actually uh, it actually use the uh, try the encoder actually try to represent the latent features as as equal to the normal distribution so the, there is some distribution came there so instead of a autoencoder as a, as the samples are taken from the distribution and it is try to be same as as the normal distribution so the mean and standard deviation is come to the uh, similar to the normal distribution. So the uh, when you uh, draw it in, in the 2D, 2D space, the uh, the clusters or the classes are well separated. Yeah. So that's why the representation you can use in the classification as well as the clustering. In the both way, the the representation, the ultimate representation from the decoder or the latent space is good. If the representation of latent space is good. So it will automatically the decoder can retrieve the good data and the reconstruction loss uh, from, as a, an output, it, it will be less. So ultimately uh, the classification will be good and the, as a training loss will be very less, the classification will be better and the clustering, if you get the only the, the data representation from the encoder, the classification uh, for, the, for, for, for the clustering, the, the class representation is also very good. So that is the main motto of VA. Well, I, th I think I think it would be really interesting. You know, I mean, again, I think one of the important things about the dynamic causal models is that um, 
uh, or, you know, one of the one of the interesting results that have come from people using these DCMs has been that uh, not just how they model the data, but also how you can cluster subjects on the basis of of different models. You know, and, and this idea that um, uh, uh, I mean, partly with patient population. But I think just reflecting the, the uh, human heterogeneity in terms of how we perform tasks. You know, some people will are basically doing the task differently, you know? Yes, yes, and, yes, yes. And, it, and it, it, it's not so much like one person's doing it right, one person's doing it wrong, is that it just reflects that, um, that brains are self-organized yes. in terms of how they, they come about. And they can do tasks differently, right? And yes, yes right, right. right. Uh, I agree. Yeah. And, and so it, it, it the easy, easy task is uh, actually mainly based on the different types of design. How you design the task? It is yeah. the main thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and then, but then there's this, there's this, you know, it, it, you know, uh, inherent assumption that you know, given the task design, right? Mm -hmm. But all these brains are doing it the same way, you know. Yes. That, uh, it, it, you know, it, like that's what we're assuming, right? When we when we do our our you know when we're doing our a novas on time points or something like that, yes. right? Is and I also find I also found one thing uh, that it is very similar that uh, in the cognitive workload, two bands, alpha bands and beta bands. Yeah. These two bands, I found many papers. Whatever they have designed the task, it is very important. These two bands. Well, I was I, I was going to say that's a that's a great point, right? So yes. um, so uh, uh, you when, can infer it. You can infer it in the in the upcoming any papers that, uh, because well, it is like, when I see that or when I, when when people report that, it it makes me think about how. We have a lot, I mean, in addition to all the other differences, and especially yes. with, with 32 channels, right, you're not really, you don't have the density to pick up the, the true spatial pattern, right? But in addition, that, that um, you might, might be interesting to look at the, uh, at the power spectrum of each subject, right? Yes. Uh, um, you know, with some, some rest periods, and and use foof you know the f o o o f package to to really look at um the individual's uh alpha and beta estimates right and like as as we know <laughs> right uh uh if we look across subjects there is variability in terms of yes, you yes, know, yes. What, a, what a subject's peak alpha is right yes. and and uh, you, you know, as well as you know, there's ten percent of the population which that don't have alpha. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, yeah, and they're normal people. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Uh, uh, you know, that that um, you know, these these are the two. You know, so alpha and beta are the two peaks that are are distinguishable in the power spectrum. From versus the the regular power law behavior, right? Oh, so sorry, yes. you know, so we 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 expect this, and you know, alpha and and beta is smaller, but uh, um, you know, alpha and beta stand out, but they stand out in different ways across subjects, and and so there is reason to believe that uh, um, you know, one, if we're just looking at bins, you know. That, that we can get we can get kind of mixed up in terms of the choice like so we talk about you know picking three seconds for the for the window uh, uh, for the for the task uh, you know you you're, you're making some choices in terms of your joint time frequency rep, you know analysis too you know uh, um, but uh, I I think it, I think you know like uh, Looking at foof on those subjects and seeing how much of the uh, the subject differences that you're seeing are perhaps uh, driven by the you know a, a rest measure of their power spectrum, 
I think would be would be interesting, like like looking at you know, uh, you know their their overall accuracy, right? So if you if you you know like like you know somebody's overall accuracy on an end back task, if it's seventy percent versus somebody who's ninety percent, right? It's like you know added you know averaging across those two subjects doesn't doesn't wholly make sense, right? No, no, no. Yes, yes. It, it, you know, it, it, it's like that's important information in a kind of, you know, between subject uh, analysis, right? It is uh, important. I, I think that foof, you know, that foof, uh, uh, you know, temp, you know, uh, spectral representation could be really important because, again, it it really, I think, it, it, it somewhat reflects the, the intersubject difference, you know, like wh how is that subject different, a as well as potentially just how their cortex is different, you know, because uh, it, it could be that kind of like their alpha generator is just pointed down, you know, or pointed in such a way that the, uh, uh, the, the nearby the, electors actually get a more excited on the time, the alpha mass. Yeah, yeah, or or you have a closed, you know, you, you could have a closed field where they've got they've got you know like two alpha generators that are basically canceling each other out, or you know, and again, it, it's really hard when you know ten twenty systems. Not only they have big big distance between two electrodes, but they don't they don't go down uh, underneath. You know, this, this is this, these areas here. Can help you pick up a dipole that you're perhaps missing, you know. Mm -hmm. And and again, it's like you know, these are you can put electrodes down here, but they're very noisy, yeah. right? you know, because it, it's like you know, if you've got if you've got electrodes on the cheek, it, it's helpful for the whole coverage of you know the sphere, but they're sitting there on muscle and you know. Yes, and, yes, yes, yes. There is a muscle it, noise is coming. Maybe. Yeah. It, so it, it, it's 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 problematic to get, but but at the same time, uh, uh, it, it's you know I, I think this is why I like DCM just because you know DCM will will push you to have a simple like three four five dipole model of the task, and then and then you can use the temporal data to distinguish between. You know, two or three different models, right? So in, instead of saying like I'm going to discover the model, you just say I'm going to do a test between a couple simple models, you know, and and, and and you know it's not the set of all models, it's just these two or three models, but you know you can uh, uh, you can use it to motivate. Uh, your your um, conclusion in terms of you know I, I don't know the NBAT task too well but like uh, um, some great papers to look at for DCM of ERTS is the um, is the the early work done on mismatch negativity right the, so so you know mismatch negativity has a couple different models that like in the 90s were proposed to explain it. And then in the 2000s, they could use DCM to, to collect some EEG data and, and say something about, you know what, there's more evidence for this model, you know, okay. on, on the basis of the EEG, you know, oh. and, it, it, you know, the EEG gave you uh, uh, enough data to distinguish and, and, and show which model was more likely, was more, you know, oh. uh, for which they had more evidence, right? And it, it does it does take having um, it does take having a couple models, but you know I think on an end back task for sure you, you could find something. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's already some DCM for ERPs uh, uh, of end back tasks. And um, uh, uh, anyway, it, it, that that's like a you know. That's a personal a personal preference. I, I think these are really powerful, you know. I I should skip it. And, and yeah, yeah. But um, uh, but yeah, thank thank you so much, though, uh, Damisha. Uh, 
Thank you. And uh, really, really uh, appreciate your time. And um, yeah, I, I, I've got some more. I've got some more notes that I'll share with you. Um, uh, but um, yeah, uh, if you're interested in in fMRI analysis too, you know, there's uh, I can point you to good data sets. Are are you already doing fMRI? Uh, no, I actually read something in fMRI, the basics of fMRI, some anatomical structure. Actually, yes. Okay. So, so you know, so my my background is actually fMRI. So, so okay, then I will take uh, take care from you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I I can uh, you know happy to to point you to uh, some, some you know I think useful useful papers there. Um, yes. But you know I I really like the um you know so go to you know open neuro right okay. uh, like openneuro.org right and and i think look for eg fmri data sets that are end back task okay right because uh um, because those exist right and and you know so you know whether you do whether you do look at like data fusion, uh, um, or whether you use the fMRI to constrain the EEG. Um, either way, I, I think it's um, it, you know you can use your experience with the EEG to do kind of better better uh, uh, you know more constrained network analysis. And you know, but I think in a in a good way constrained, you know, because uh, um, you'll have you'll have a number of you know a small number of areas that you're getting from the fMRI that you can basically use to constrain the EEG analysis in this kind of DCM way. You know? Yes. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, I'm monopolizing things, but I, I think we might have lost our. Uh, I know I, I was interested to see uh, er Eric, who joined, um, and so it was unfortunately on the bus. Uh, uh, I, believe, it, you know, I believe he's in Sweden, um, but uh, uh, you might you might check out his his um, master's thesis. I know was was um, working on cognitive workload. Uh, I, I think he was more focused on, you know, kind of, um, uh, if I remember right, he was focused on kind of performance measures more than okay. EEG, but, uh, and, um, and apparently a comment has outdone himself and has already got YouTube, uh, YouTube link for your, for your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, the um, the video we, where we have no sound, uh, just earlier, but, uh, the recording is still on. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Okay, okay, okay. Um, but, uh, Thanks a lot for yeah. the presentation. It was very interesting, and also the discussion, as always, with uh, Morgan. And, uh, and uh, a good point also on the um, on the slide, on the quality of the slide with all the information. It was very, very uh, good presentation. Also. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so can I stop my uh, sharing? Yeah, 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 of course. Okay. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I hope you, uh, I hope you join us for the for the hackathon. And you know, again, we're hoping to to have some good um, uh, some good collaborations between cities too. And, okay. Uh, sure. To, yeah. Yeah. Because uh, you know, I, I, I mean, it's super impressive what you've done. Uh, uh, I think it's really hard to get um, good generalization from this. Uh, uh, you know, is yes, uh, stuff. Is, yeah, that uh, you know, and and, um, and again, for these kinds of you know, uh, uh, for these kinds of numbers and this kind of channel count. You know, it, it's it's very really hard. You know, but um, you know, look at um, you know there are big data sets now available 
that have high density, you know, high channel count uh, data from thousands of subjects, you know? Oh. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like this exists. <laughs> So uh, um, I, you know, so I, I think that's that makes it really possible to take a couple of models and say which one is this person using, mm. you know, when when you've got thousands, you know, when you've got thousands of examples, you know, with performance measures, with physiological measures, uh, um, this is possible and uh, and. Yes. Um, and uh, Roman, did you see the uh, um, the link uh, uh, Corey dropped? But you know, uh, like my Twitter feed is is super active with this uh, uh, Tang paper. H have you seen it? Uh, I'm not sure which one you. So so uh, this is a group um, uh, at University of Texas Austin. And uh, so this is fMRI of naturalistic uh, images, or you know, basically it's it's fMRI of people watching movies, okay? And so they're watching movies, and uh, what these uh, what this lab has done. This is Alexander Kutz's lab in, in UT Austin. Uh, if you think of it as um, like reverse stable diffusion. Okay, so so given an image, give me the text, right? And, and but but the person's watching a movie, okay? So so what you get is basically, but as the person's watching the movie, they're processing the fMRI, and it's just generating a a, a stream of text describing the, the image oh right and, and and so what they're getting is like a kind of rough description of the movie via the fMRI of the person watching the movie <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the uh, in slack you see it as a uh, um, uh, Corey is the person who, who dropped the link. Um, okay. It's you know. it's the it's from the, the study with um, uh, when they try to they try to draw uh, the dream of the people based on I don't I don't I'm not sure if, if it's fMRI or well there's, there's definitely you know like like I said to Simon who joined us earlier you know uh, I was like. This is very much uh, following um, uh, uh, Jack Galant's group. Like, like if, if I remember right, uh, Alexander Huth came out of uh, uh, Jack Galant's group at Berkeley, and they did the uh, original work where it was like they had images of of different classes of objects, and they would they would show people these images in the scanner. And based on, you know, based on decoding the fMRI, they'd be like, oh, that's a picture of a house. Oh, that's a picture of a person. Oh, that's a picture, you know. And, and, and they, would, they would get that, you know, quite, quite accurately. Uh, uh, so you can think of this as somewhat like, like just taking that to, you know, a, a, a movie. Uh, uh, but but this is where uh, uh, I believe the the um, the training you know is basically recognizing things that are out of sample you know uh, um, and like yeah still still quite impressive. <clears throat> With the data set you mentioned earlier, I, I was thinking about the Donders Institute and they have access to a big, huge database with thousands of people with uh, fMRI and other acquisi data acquisition. So that is, it's part of the Human Brain Project, I think, in Europe. So that's also a big data set to, to, uh, you can have a look for. Well, sure. I mean, I, I, I would hope that that's on OpenNeuro. <laughs> I don't know. 
uh, I can ask. Uh, please do, please do. It, 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 because, you know, uh, again, as part of the, I mean, I, I think of the hackathon as, as just the start of, I hope, you know, many like data challenges. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, in terms of collecting data sets that might be important or, you know, valuable, uh, if, if Open Neuro doesn't have them, I, I want to know. <laughs> yeah, I, I will check if it's open or not, uh, but uh, I'm sure that it's available from the people in the Donders Institute for, for sure. Well, then but let's, yeah, yeah. It, and then if you could let me know who, who would be a good contact person. Yeah, I can, yeah. I can send you the contact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's really, um, yeah, okay. I, I remember so that they have uh, like specific, um, a uh, specific dedicated but, server to, to access to that and to process a lot of data. So that's sure. a big architecture. Sure, sure. Yes, hi, Tabasis. Yeah, uh, more than one request is that uh, tomorrow morning I have, I have one flight. So can I really? leave for today? Yeah. <laughs> it's actually 12.10. 12, 12, Thank <laughs> you so much. In India. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry for, uh, we can't, I cannot uh, continue no the entire topic. Yeah. Well, next yeah. time I will try. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. We, we, we make a joke. Uh, uh, when it's midnight, uh, it's pumpkin time. Uh, uh, you know, and no, no, yeah. it's not for every day. You, you <laughs> are absolutely to. allowed to go uh, at midnight. You know? <laughs> yeah. No problem, no problem. Thank, it's a very, good, uh, very good uh, collaboration. And I also find yeah. very interesting also. Uh, getting know getting to know various things and i also pointed out the top yeah, the things that you have suggested uh, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll follow up we'll, we'll, we'll keep talking yes 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 so i can yeah. i can improve myself also as well so thank you and thank you roman as well you're welcome and thanks thank you thanks of yes uh, we'll meet again okay <laughs> yeah have a good yeah. flight bye bye yeah good thank you okay. bye. Bye. hey worry Yes. Hey. Oh, How's it going, guys? Somebody else joined. Yeah.